Welcome back to another episode of Rebel Driver's Garage. It's time for me to fix my 65 Impala Project Evil Orchid. I screwed it up. Rocky Mountain Race Week this year, uh, last year, Kearney, Nebraska, day one. I made two passes on it, and somehow I messed up the clutch. Probably user error, but I got to figure out what's going on. So I got to pull the engine and transmission to figure it out, because it's the only way I'm going to get that T56 transmission out of this car. So first things first, I got to make some room in my garage because I got my Galaxy in here as well. So I got to move this out, turn the Impala around, and. Do some like automotive, uh, what's it going? Automotive rearranging. The Impala turned around. It still does run and drive, but the clutch is not happy at all. Not at all. Let me uh, turn the power on in the car. Oh yeah, got to open the garage door. That would be helpful. To recap, this is my 65 Impala SS. I've owned it since 1996. I bought it from a kid who had dreams of turning it into a load rider, but ran out of money on another car. It is currently powered by a blueprint engine small block 400. Uh, this oops got my finger in the way. Uh, this this is a currently a uh, this is their blueprints. Power adder version, but there's no power adder as you can see. It's just a uh, naturally aspirated right now, uh, which is kind of nice because I can. Run, I'm running this engine on 87 octane right now. See, there is a hydraulic clutch reservoir that's a Hydromax system hiding down in the down there from American Powertrain, and behind all that is a America Power Train T56 Magnum 6 speed uh, there is a quick time bell housing and a McLeod RXT twin disc clutch um, in all honesty I think there's nothing wrong with these parts it's just something wrong with the person that was operating the vehicle mm -hmm. yeah 
Um, I think we're going to find that out pretty quick is that um, I have this kind of habit. I have a really bad habit. I got to really think about it when I'm driving, when I'm racing the car is to get my damn flip foot off the clutch pedal. And I don't think I did that. Uh, and I think I hurt the clutch doing so. We'll find out when we get it apart. Let's get to fixing this. The first thing we got to do before we do anything else, I'm going to start draining fluids. While I'm draining fluids, I'm going to go into the interior. And I got to take the console out in order to get the shifter off the top of the transmission because that's going to come out, the shifter does. And then uh, we'll start draining fluids. Ooh, look at that. A nickel. I am rich. Might help pay for this. I'm going to have to put that in my pocket here. Yeah. Pay for this mess I'm in the broken parts. Well, I was supposed to take the, co the console out and the shifter, but I ended up taking the radiator out instead and draining the radiator. The radiator's over there on the floor. Um, I also started messing around, doing some organizing on the shelves. I disconnected almost everything underneath the car. Uh, the dry shaft is out of the rear end and out of the transmission. Dry, uh, the transmission's just being held up. Well, it's still being held up by the cross member for right now. Oops. Um, but I do have a floor jack underneath it. The only way I can get any up or down movement is I have to take I had to take the uh, the rubber mount out of it. So um, uh, emergency brake cable's been loosened. Ooh, I forgot one thing. I forgot to take the uh, speedometer cable out. That would've been kind of fun to pull. And then headers are connected from the exhaust. Uh, I took some of the the uh, lower um, bell house uh, scatter shield bolts that connect the scatter shield to the block plate out. Uh, but the motor mounts, are, the motor mount bolts are still in, mainly because the weight uh, there's weight on them. It's not like a, when you set the motor on the mounts, there's no longer any weight. You just shove the bolts through. Uh, with these steel bolt, uh, mounts on it, they uh, they. Uh, um, uh, the bolt is basically taking all the weight. Oh yeah, there's one other thing I forgot to do. I forgot to disconnect the hydraulic clutch from uh, the lines and have to drain the clutch out. So uh, I think I can leave that in for right now. Figure out what to do with that. Okay, the uh, engine's pretty much ready to come out. The only thing I have holding the engine in is basically gravity and the bolts stuck through there but I got to get some of the weight off the motor in order to get those bolts out oops standing on spoke gas anyway see there's the other bolt down there the header is just kind of sitting down there right now I uh, she kind of got wedged um, when I move the car back and why did I move the car back well as you can see here I've got this thing going on here and this contraption going on up to the rafters to uh, get the hood off by myself. Should be a good time. And uh, if I'm careful, I got moving blankets over the windshield, even though it's cracked and needs to be replaced anyways. So um, just in case. And uh, one man job of getting the hood off. Let's see if it works. Alright, so what I need is a ratchet and a 9 16 socket. There you go. Start taking bolts out. Dropping crap. Dropping crap. Mm -hmm. There we go. I guess I can get this off the fender.
This all works because I don't have a forty thousand dollar paint job. <laughs> now I need to set up the engine hoist, and then I'll have to push the car back out. Uh, at least to the tire back tires hit the concrete in order to have enough room in front of the car to use the engine hoist and pull the engine out and transmission. Well, I got the engine and transmission out of the car. The hood is safely on the roof of the car, along with one of the headers. Uh, I was going to put it in the trunk, but I accidentally latched the trunk. Uh, anyway, uh, it's amazing how filthy this thing got. And just one real summer of driving. Jeez. I'm going to clean it up. I have some oil leak somewhere, which i got to find. I think it's the valve cover bolts. Yeah, these blueprint heads are a pain in the butt to keep clean. Your valve cover bolts are stupid. They have a slot that runs across here behind the valve cover bolt, and it's for uh, it's for if you're running center bolt valve covers, which you can't do if you're running roller rockers. So what's the point? It just kind of all it does is cause oil leaks. And anyway. Um, well, I'm gonna next is I'm gonna put I'm gonna get it back up in the air a little bit and I'm gonna pull the transmission off and figure out what the hell I did to the clutch. That'll be in the morning, it's after eight, and I want I'm gonna cook some dinner. Welcome back. Uh, it's the next morning. Uh, last night I got the engine and transmission out, they're on the floor. So the next step today is to figure out what I did to the clutch, and that means getting the transmission off the back of the bell housing taking the bell housing off and looking at the clutch and such. So I need to get the engine and the transmission so I can move it around a little bit. So I was thinking about using that, um, let me switch over. Using that, I used this stool before when I put it together. When I was putting in the hydraulic clutch and it actually works pretty well, but I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna get a ratchet strap to kind of hold it on there a little better than just like gravity. So I'll be right back. Okay, so I don't know how well this is gonna work, but this is my, uh, my ratchet strap, a cheap one I got probably from Walmart or Home Depot or something. What I'm going to do first is unbolt the transmission from the from the bell housing, which is all these Allen bolts. And I probably should have bought undo the bottom ones first that are right up against the seat of this stool before I started this. So I probably have to back this up, re-loosen this up, and. And, uh, 
get those two bottom ones out. Go backwards a bit here. So, lift up that 900 pound. There we go. That. The reason why I had the stool so far close to it, because it is kind of front heavy. So, let me grab some tools. Let me pull this back forward. Lift it up and shove forward. Uh, and it went out the side. There we go. Ow. Something sharp. That'll work. We tighten the ratchet straps. Yeah, I might hold it. <laughs> Again, it might not. We will find out here in a minute. There we go. Oh yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> that actually, actually holding it. All right. Well. Seems to be holding it okay. It's a little tail shaft heavy, but that's all right. I'm gonna move this out of the way right now so we can get to the bell housing. This is a quick time uh, scatter shield. I'm gonna need a 916 as well. Looks like I forgot. I added this one extra bolt here. Um, the Bluebird block actually has a bolt hole here. A lot of stock blocks don't. Um, it's not really necessary, but a scatter shield is, is designed to contain the clutch if it ever explodes. And that's why you have all these bolts running across the bottom. Uh, some of the old Lakewood scatter shields had a big flange that came up above the bell housing like this. And you had more bolts up here as well. Um, so, uh, the bow, a scatter shield had the bolt holes and the bolt hole was in the in block so I added one extra bolt just in case because it's never cool to have I don't know if you guys have ever seen videos of this on this channel here on not on my channel but on YouTube here that <laughs> where clutches explode and basically come through the floorboard of a car like a saw blade and I don't know if you ever noticed this but your right foot's usually about right here when you're driving so um that would not be cool. Can you see? I'm going to turn this towards you. Uh, this is a McLeod twin disc. Uh, it's an RXT um, version. Uh, they rate it near a thou uh, thousand pounds uh, or a thousand horsepower. Um, and I have a big heavy car. So. I didn't want to use the single disc, and uh, this is the one they recommended, and and some people that I trust also recommended this one as well. So we're just going to get it off, and I'll see what we got here. Let's see how much damage I've done to this damn thing. Well, smooth. I don't see any real problems. I mean, the, as you can see, the, the uh, pressure plate has a lot of heat in it. And the secondary plate here has had a lot of heat in it. But oh, there's a little bit of grooving there on the inside. Well, we've got another plate to get to. There's another clutch this guy gotta get out. So let's get. Oh wow! There's a lot of clutch dust coming out now. 
Well, not a lot, but there's clutch dust coming out. So maybe the bottom disc is, took the brunt of it. See, uh, there's all the materials there. All the pucks are still there. Let's get to the, obviously something's ever taken a lot of heat, but as you can see here, there's a little bit of grooving on the inside of everything. So. Like the pressure plate shows a little bit of grooving on the inside. And a little bit of the same deal on the flywheel right here. It's not something that catches your fingernail. And there's a little bit on the outside, but still. I'm not sure why that's happened. Hmm. Uh, the uh, pilot bearing a, is a needle bearing style and it seems to be fine. So I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm going to get an impact take these out. Um, and then we'll start putting a new one in. See what we get. my clutch because um, the last engine I worked on at work took under the last bolt on the flywheel and the clutch the flywheel fell on the floor. It was like so loose on the back of the crank. This one is um, nice, and, nice and snug. So. Like it falls. <laughs> now look. Yeah. There's an oil leak right there from where I put the pan gasket on. So that's me. Uh, it's not blueprint. I um, I changed out the oil pan because I wanted one with a. F uh, I wanted one with the. Uh, uh, baffle in it, uh, or a windage tray, excuse me. So, I'm going to take a DA grind, a sander to this uh, flywheel and resurface it because it's not very deep grooves in it. Okay, so I'm going to use a DA sander here with 180 grit to resurface this flywheel. See what we get. See if it works. If not, I'll take it down to the local machine shop and have them do it. And, um, and see what we get. Um, as soon as I turn this thing on, the compressor is going to turn on, so I'll just speed through it so you don't have to listen to the compressor. <laughs> So I have my flywheel on. This is a McLeod 30 pound clutch. I mean, 30 pound steel flywheel. It has a little line left on it from the old, the old clutch. 
it got a little bit of heat in it, but I cleaned it up and, and put it back on. The uh, pilot bearing is in there. This is a this is a needle bearing style, and it is it spins nice and freely in there. So I'm gonna reuse it. Most clutches use. Uh, uh, this actually came with the um, American Power Train unit with the T56 kit. Uh, most clutches use a bronze style uh, pilot bearing, which you should always replace because bronze will wear out really quickly. And uh, these needle bearings, you can reuse them, but make sure that the needle bearing, I'm sticking my pinky in here, the needle bearing moves nice and freely. There's no grinding or anything like that. And I'm gonna reuse that one. I do have some brawn ones on the shelf if I want to, uh, if I don't like this one. But I'm just gonna reuse it. So, what do we have? This is a 30 pound steel flywheel. There's a block plate behind the flywheel that goes to the, um, the uh, quick time scatter shield. And oh, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I have put a uh, flywheel on only to forget the plate. Um, in this case, the flywheel's on. This is an SFI rated one, I guess, too. Um, this car's too slow for needing that just yet, but hopefully it'll be fast enough in the future. The applications for flywheels are obviously different for every vehicle. This one is externally balanced. Even this is a 400 small block from Blueprint Engines that's painted Evening Orchid, which is the original color of my 65 Impala. Not that that's really relevant. As you can see, it's got some driving time on it. I have been driving it. Uh, these have a new block. They have after, there's nothing GM on these engines at all. It's all aftermarket parts. And what this one has, it's unusual. Um, General Motors made 400 small blocks that were uh, externally balanced from 1970 to 1978. Eight, maybe 1980 yeah 1980 uh, they were the only factory small block that was externally balanced up till 1986 when GM to went to a one piece rear main seal on their 350s and 305s and uh, by that time they weren't making anything else so there were um, and those had an externally fly external balanced flywheel which was different from the externally balanced uh, flywheels that were used on the four small buck 400s. Mainly because the crankshaft changed where, and the design of the crankshaft for the one piece remain seal was different than the earlier 1970 to 1980 small buck 400s. Uh, they had a two piece remain seal and the rear of the crank was different. As a matter of fact, this is a one-piece rear main seal from Blueprint Engines. It's odd duck for that. It's balanced like an 86 and newer 350 Chevy. So it's got an externally, internally balanced balancer on the front. On the front, see? And an externally balanced flywheel on the back. Check your application, make sure you get the right one. GM small blocks and big blocks are also have a dowel pin here, so you cannot put them on wrong. You cannot put them on in the wrong position. There are other engines that do, um, like I did a 428 Ford recently, and they only had they had six bolts as well, but they didn't have a dowel pin. But the way the flywheel was drilled and the crank was drilled only all six bolts would holes would line up in one position so you could not put it on wrong um why you're asking here is the screwdriver shoved through here this is so i can torque the bolts to 65 foot pounds uh the the flywheel bolts to 65 foot pounds which is the uh correct torque rate spec for a small block chevy uh and with no spark plugs in the engine it would roll over pretty easily so, I use this to torque them. Torque in a crisscross pattern, like that. Go over it a couple of times, and I'll show you. So the next thing I gotta do is I gotta measure the depth. And what you're doing is you're measuring the depth of the fingers, the highest point of the fingers, 
on the clutch pressure plate to the surface here. And this is measuring the uh, free play between the clutch um, throw out bearing and the clutch fingers when when it's closed when the clutch um, so I've been doing this for a while now I have the f I'm just using a t-square here because it will sit flat on the bell housing here and it's stiff enough that I don't have to worry about it and then I've been um, putting um, uh, my uh, my dial indicator here, my digital dial indicator here, on the ties point of the fingers, and what I'm trying to do is get a consensus. So it's not easy to do because you got to hold this flat and this parallel. I mean, a perpendicular in a ninety degree angle, and I'm doing it on top because there's a there's kind of a the leading edge of this is kind of flat. And then I'm going to have to do another measurement here in a minute. I'll show you. And what I got to, so about 2.302, 2.303, somewhere in that range is what I got. Now, that isn't the exact measurement of this to there so much as it is the measurement of that to there plus the thickness of this which I got an amount now measured so the thickness of my t-square metal is point zero get it square on there so you can get an accurate reading scale point eight oh all right that's what I'm gonna go with so we're doing old school math here. So, forgive me, I haven't done math this way in a long time. My calculator happens to be in the same camera that you're looking through. So, 13 minus 8 is 7. Oops, put the decimal point in the wrong place. There you go. Does that look like what you guys have? All right. You forgive me because I haven't really done this kind of math problems without a calculator since the 19... I'm not saying. So... So that's the depth we're going to go with from the face of the clutch of the pressure uh, bell housing to the teeth on the pressure plate. Now... We have to measure, oops, well now we have to measure the face uh, where the bell how the, the transmission uh, belts to the bell housing and the depth of this, uh, the throw, uh, hydraulic throw bearing, and what we're looking for is a difference between this should be one tenth of an inch to two tenths of an inch shorter uh, distance between here and here, and the distance between there and the fingers and the, and the face of the of the pressure of bell housing. If I if I can speak, that's all, folks. Now, um, now what we want is the reason why you want one to two uh, two tenths of an inch is so this spins freely. And is not putting pressure on the pressure plate when the clutch pedal is released. That way, the clutch is fully engaged on the flywheel, and all the power from the engine, all the horsepowers from the engine, are going through the transmission, and um, and not being soaked up by a clutch that's slipping. So, time to measure this. This is going to be a little more difficult because I this face here is a little bit higher than that face there on that so I might have to do some more math mathematicians here math positions what do you call it it's been so long since I've done this stuff there is a little bit of light on the straight edge between here and the straight edge across going across from there to there 
and a little bit of light in there, not a lot, but um, what I will do is this, is I'll take the measurement from here to here, and then I'll add whatever I can get a feeler gauge in between the two, which is not a lot, but it will, not the same. So, one point eight four zero. Yeah, so we're talking about five thousandths of an inch here between the 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 face of the clutch, uh, the bell housing face of the transmission, and the face of the bearing cover here is about five thousandths of an inch. So I got to add five thousandths of an inch to my measurement. So uh, I got to add five thousandths to this measurement here. So that is so. All right. So it'd be one point eight four five. All right. So. If this is 1.73 and this is 1.845, so 1.845 minus 1.703, So, so 0.142 inches is what I got here, right? So that's. And you want to be between 0 0.100 and 2.00. And it seems that we're right in the middle. Or pretty close to being dead center in the middle between those two. So, um, how, what do you think of this measurement? Do you think that's about right? So, if my, um, my old school calculations are correct with the old math. Not the new math. I don't know what the new math is. Where you have to, I guess the new math is you have to ask its feelings. Uh, for well, how do you feel about this measurement? Uh, do you feel that's correct? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to uh, go with it. Uh, this is old school math here. This is the depth of the bell housing face to the to the clutch fingers. Oh, well, actually, looks farther than that. And then um, this is the depth of the face of the throw bearing to where the face of the transmission bolts to the bell housing so you minus that first step this step is so it means you have a free space of 0 0.142 inches and uh, and it needs to be between 100 and or 0.100 and 0.200 inches, so it's right in the middle. So we're gonna go with it. I'm gonna double check it. I'm gonna put a feeler gauge in between here and here. Once I get it bolted back together, and see what we got. And hopefully it measures out to the same as this. So I should be able to stick a 14. Uh, 0 0.014, 0 0.14 feeler gauge between the two and have just enough room so it doesn't drag because of that extra two thousandths of an inch. We'll see. Alrighty, let's see if we can get this thing to slide in nice and easy like. I think I still need to raise up the engine a little bit higher. I'm trying to get the uh, I can tip the motor, the trans back on the stool here a little bit. He's kind of close. Get, get that over there. Got to watch out for the manhood there. it up some more. Ooh. 
There she goes. There she goes. Just gotta find the right hole. Pretty close. Oh, uh, not going in straight. Very straight here. Angle's not right. The angle of the dangle. There's a dowel pin that's supposed to go in that hole there. Well, that's pretty close. I can at least get the bolt started. Get these going here so it goes on the dowel pins on the bell housing. Because not only does the bell housing have dowel pins on the block, it's got to go on. There's dowel pins on here that got, it's got to go on as well. You don't want to force it, you'll strip the threads. If it isn't lining up right, it won't go on the dowel pins. You want it nice, smooth. You can draw it in with a bolt. It's nicer to have it go all the way in nice and easy without it, but... It's about, I should have cleaned the dowel pins off. They had a little bit of surface rust on them. That's going in nice. If she's not sliding in nice and easy like this, and there's something really wrong, and stop. If it doesn't want to go in like this, nice and easy, then you need to figure out why. I already did the uh, bell housing alignment um, with a dial indicator when I first put this together. And I don't think this engine's old enough to have a lot of core shifting going on where the dowel pins have moved. So, I spent hours doing that. That is really, really important. If you have, if the, if the bell housing isn't centered on the back of the, on the back of the, uh, um, the engine block, and you try to put a manual transmission in, what will happen is the uh, you'll be forcing the the uh, the input shaft of the transmission off at an angle. And let me tell you, that ain't good for your uh, that ain't good for your transmission's input bearing either, because you'll it'll start making noises pretty darn fast, and I mean really fast, and. So that's why you want to do it. It's, it's annoying. It takes forever. And on this particular bell housing, it's real hard because you have this big opening here. They have a plate that you can buy. QuickTime does. And uh, that makes it a perfect circle opening. It's about 100 bucks. And it's worth doing if you've never, if you haven't done it, to get make sure you have a nice make sure your transmission's input shaft is going into the clutch and then into the into the pilot bearing in the back of the crank nice and straight because if it isn't straight and it's being forced off to one side or the other like this or up it's going to put pressure on the input bearing and it'll start making horrible like noises like I like rocks in your transmission type noises and that's something you don't want to hear well I must have screwed something up because look how much space there is between the clutch fingers and the throw out bearing there. So I'm going to have to pull it apart, figure out what I did wrong. And that is why I can stick my hand in between those two. Okay, I ran into a couple of problems. I took my intake manifold off because I wanted to seal it. It wasn't sealing very well. 
Um, some reason oil is getting past the RTV on the China rails. So I guess there was, uh, so the, the RTV didn't stick is what I'm getting at. It stuck to the intake manifold, but not the China rails on the block. So I probably had oil or some other residue on it that kept it from sticking. So, um, so I'm going to do a better job this time. I took the intake manifold off, but I ran into a couple of problems when I noticed when I had it off. And this is why you check things when you take things apart. Take a look at this. The first thing I came across was my distributor gear. And as you can see, the teeth have been chewed up pretty bad. Now I checked the oil when I drained it and I ran it through um, a filter when I was draining it into my big, my big uh, 55 gallon oil drum over here. There's no metal in it, but damn, the teeth are about gone. So this must be a cast iron, um, this must be a cast iron uh, 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 distributor gear, which is what this distributor is. It's an 8360, right? And I got this through Blueprint Engines, um, and it wasn't ever installed. And this is one that was never installed. And I got it through like their eBay page and um, for like their leftover parts and stuff. So, but I assumed that the ones that they had, I made the assumption that it was bad that this they they had uh, melanized gears on there because they use cast uh, ductile iron roller camshafts, which I will show you here. Uh, climb over the engine compartment here so you can so I can see. Ah. Okay. So. All right. So let me grab a light. As if you look at the camshaft in between the lobes, you can see that it's just cast. That is not a billet piece of metal. So it's a ductile iron. And um, if it was billet. Uh, like a lot of roller camshafts are, then um, uh, then you would need like a bronze gear. But um, but uh, you can use melanized gear uh, distributor ship, distributor gears, melanized distributor gears on uh, billet uh, camshafts as well. The reason why I'm not using a bronze one on this is because bronze ones wear out every once uh, like much faster than melanized. So I ordered a melanized gear, as you can see. I didn't do any cleaning on these China rails at all. And there's no RTV stuck to it at all. And the same with the back. So I don't know. Maybe I used the wrong stuff. I, I used uh, right stuff gray. But it did not stick at all. And oil was dripping over the side. And it would make it make the front of the just your engine all dirty. The second thing I noticed. And I thought I had solved this problem a year ago or two years ago. Is if you look, oh man, I don't know. See how, okay, see the oil trail coming from the rocker stud there? That is oil coming from the intake rocker stud that is drilled all the way into the intake ports. And um, that one is the only uh, one. And I think this other one, this that was number seven, and this is number eight, which has got oil all over the intake runner. So, and it looks like it's oil coming out of the top of that. So I got to reseal those two. I got so I'm pulling the valve covers off of this anyways to uh, reseal them because I've had some issues with them, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, there's some special things that Blueprint Engine does on these heads um, for uh, for being able to run uh, center bolt valve covers on these heads. There's a groove on the inside of these bolt holes right here. And if you don't get the RTV, you have to put uh, RTV on either side of the groove, on either side of the bolt hole, in order to keep oil from coming up the threads of the bolt and running over and causing a big oil leak. I'll show you that when I get the valve covers off. But So I found those two issues. So I'm gonna, I got a new distributor here coming from MSD. It's a melanized one. And then I'm going to... Um, uh, and then I'm going to uh, take care of those when I have the valve covers off. So I'm going to remove the intake rocker arms and pull the rocker studs out and put a thread sealer on them a little better than I had. Looks like I still got to do a little bit of cleanup back here. 
for the new gasket. But um, all I had for gasket sealant was around the water ports like that. I didn't put any around the intake ports. And um, and then I had R obviously R RTV across the China rails because I ne nobody ever uses the gaskets on the end gaskets. I don't even know why they include them in gasket sets for intake manifolds anymore, but nobody ever uses them. So I'm going to try... Um, I'm going to make sure this is really clean. I'm going to use probably a lacquer thinner on these rails to make sure there's no oil residue so the, the RTV actually sticks this time and doesn't leak anymore. Here's the intake manifold. It's all cleaned up a little. I cleaned it up a little bit. Um, I just used brake clean on it and a toothbrush. It cleaned up kind of the oil residue that was building up on it. I'm changing up thermostat. Uh, my thermostat was doing weird things. It would have kept opening at different temperatures. There's a 180 thermostat and sometimes it would open at like 190 and then other times it would open as high as 220 which is definitely concerning. And you look over time you know your your temperature gauge and um, it is uh it's still you know that the temperature the the thermostat hasn't been opened yet. <laughs> so I'm replacing that. I cleaned up the uh, the water neck here this is an aluminum one. It's like a stock, a stock replacement type one, but it's aluminum. The original ones were iron, which I prefer, but you know how it is. Nothing, nothing's made of iron anymore. And then I'm going to clean up the bolts. Um, I had some rust on the threads on the front bolts here, which I'm guessing means that these bolt holes here go into the water jacket. You can see there's some rust in the threads there. And I'm thinking that there might be some, uh, uh, that the bolt holes are open to the water jacket and the cylinder heads, which I didn't think the end bolts were, but they might be on these set of heads. Let me see here. So, uh, it, it feels like it's a deadheaded bolt, so I'm not sure why there was water on the threads unless I had some seepage coming across from, the, from here past the gasket, but I didn't see any. Um, I'm going to clean up those bolts. I'll show you the bolts in here in a second. One of the bolts that were on the ends, and the bolts are deadheaded, so I don't know why there was rust on them. That's weird. None of the, only the four end bolts had any, um, any, uh, rust on, on the threads, which is odd because the bolts don't go into the water jacket. The rest of them had thread sealer on it, and as you can see, the rest of them look fine. See, yeah, like that's practically super clean. But that's the in, sorry about that. That's not the that's the water neck jam bulk it. See here, okay, here's a I'm gonna focus on the bolt dummy. See, and um these are perfectly con uh clean. <laughs> so I'm gonna clean up the ones that need being cleaned up and before I put them back in with the um ARP's thread sealer. Here I got my uh, headers all sandblasted and painted. These are uh, ones that I had made myself. They are actually off. They were actually originally a a, uh, a set of Mopar big block headers that I cut up and put new flanges on and did some rearranging of the pipes. This side here, I'm, I wish I could do better. This is the passenger side. See this pipe here? How it kind of comes away a little bit way out from here. Now it's got a dent in it. That's from the steering link. It's just from the center link. And it comes back in. When I originally designed these, and I don't know what happened between mock-up and actual welding, is that this kind of separated. And uh, so, um, if anything I'd like to do is I'd like to do this over again. So I can get these back together close like they were originally. And probably have to shorten that pipe up a bit to do it. Um, Mopar guys will recognize the, how this this front one comes back and down and like that. Now this one is uncut as you can see. That is untouched. There's no welds in that one at all. That is the original uh, number 8 pipe from the Mopar big block header. This is the number 2 pipe that I never touched except I shortened it from here to here because obviously a Mopar is, a lo is longer front to back on a small block Chevy. Um, this header over here is completely from scratch there is one pipe in here 
these two pipes here started off uh, as you can see, there's, they're not really cut. Uh, this one's not cut at all. And it makes it all the way down to its first bend before it gets cut. This is actually from the original uh, Mopar header as well. This one's got a cut here and a cut here and a cut here. And see, you can see this one's there, there, there. And I, this one actually fits really well considering, um, considering how curvy it is. And it goes around the oil filter and everything, the, motor, the steering box, really well. Even on cylinder heads that have a half inch higher exhaust port. These I could drop right in from the top. Uh, even with a starter in it if I want to. Um, and I don't have a lot of problems with plug, plug wire. You know, none of the plugs, plug wires have problems with clearance. They don't get anywhere near the headers for plug wires. I did dent a couple of the tubes over the years to give a little more clearance for longer spark plugs. See, there and there. And, but I'm kind of happy with them. It was kind of a stupid thing. I bought them, I thought they were small block Chevy headers and and I didn't really have any, you know, reference points. It just, they look, you know, one, two, one, just like a Mopars are. And, and then I did became a, an exercise and whether or not I could do it. So that's what I did. I did it. So the reason why the door is open is because it is, look at this, it's February and it's the mid sixties. I love this. So anyhow, um, there's a bit of harsh lighting because of it. Forgive me, but I mean, how could you not? If, you, if you're from the middle, you know, snow country, like I am, I'm in the middle of Nebraska. And how could you not want to have the door open when it's warm enough to have the door open with this, with this, with your sweatshirt on and just be comfortable in the, it's like the last week of February. Come on. I can even hear my neighbor. Um, he's, he's, he's running his motorcycle. I guess he's got something he's testing or whatever. something he built over the winter. And, uh, um, I've been hearing my hot, my friends with my neighbors with hot rods and other stuff going running up and down the street. So it's such a beautiful day here. So forgive me if the lighting's a little harsh. I will try to get better lighting when I um, as the day goes along as you can see I got the car way up on jack stands in order to do um, I'm gonna get I had to tilt the engine in order to get that header in and I've been working on the stuff uh, top stuff and I literally been standing in the engine compartment I'll show you Need to put on a hood by yourself. All you need is a couple of ratchet straps and one of these ratchet things that you hang your dead deer with. But I got it, the Cabela's. And makes it a lot easier. So, I got the car back together. Um, I had to stop and go backwards for a minute. Um, when I did all the measurements for the, uh, the clutch adjustment, I did not have the uh, throwout bearing fully collapsed, so my measurements were completely off. I also uh, heard back from a cloud on the clutch that I sent back in, the old one that was in this car that I kind of screwed up, and it was my fault. Uh, <laughs> somehow, I managed to put washers under the um, th uh, pressure plate that was supposed to be in the on top of the pressure plate. So obviously the pressure plate wasn't doing all the pressuring that it needs to be pressured. So uh, that was my fault. And um, I really appreciate it. McLeod is rebuilding the clutch for me and they actually got it done already and they're already shipping it back to me, which is great. I'll have a spare. So next time I do a, like a Rocky Mountain Race Week or a Drag Week or something, I'll have a spare to take with me. Also, I have I, I did confirm off camera. So, oh yeah, in order to pull the I did not have to pull the entire tra engine transmission out. I did not. I um, 
Um, I found, I went up to Harbor Freight, <laughs> and I was like, I am not pulling this whole thing out again. No, I'm not pulling it all out again. So I went up to Harbor Freight and bought it. I was going to buy a transmission jack. And they had two kinds. The really enormous ones, like huge, that are designed to carry like a thousand pounds. And you can't even get underneath the car with the transmission jack underneath the car. Or, and I got this one. I'm going to show you. I got a, something in the way. But this, this little baby right here. This one was only $125. And it just uses, it's like a little mini scissor lift, really. Um, it's got this, you uh, stick a ratchet in there. And, it, and it's got this uh, ratchet strap. Though I'm going to put a smaller ratchet strap on it. Because this big buckle... It's a little hard to use when it's in a trans tunnel. So other than that, this thing worked epically. And I was able to back the transmission back and up far enough to uh, re-shim and re-measure the throw-out bearing clearance like I did earlier. And put it all back together without having to take the whole engine and transmission out of the car. It was great. And it worked perfectly. And it tilts too. You can, it does tilt. Um, you just adjust it with these. Uh, it's not as fancy. It doesn't have the screws, but it does work fantastic for an automatic trans... I mean, my little stick shift transmission. Um, I probably would want something big if I was doing it like a 4L80, and I don't know if I would want to put a 4L80 on something like that. So, um, but it works great with a 4-speed or 5-speed or anything like that. Even my big giant 6-speed worked good. So, um, so... What's next? I got to test drive it. Um, I was going to test drive it tonight, but it's raining. And I just washed the car. I'm like, look at it. It's clean. It's clean. And I, I don't want to get it dirty. Okay? Don't make fun of me. I don't want to get my car dirty. It's washed. I, look, I know. We were desperate for rain. And we had to have rain. So I washed my car to guarantee it'll be raining. Yeah, that 30% rain turned into 100% rain because I washed my car. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, anyhow, uh, we'll go out and I'll, I'll show you what it's going to, I'm going to get it running and uh, we'll do a video on me test driving it. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, please comment. Ask me a question in the comments. I'm always trying, I'm I don't answer like like the next 15 minutes, but I do try to answer every single comment that has a legitimate question that actually makes sense. Uh, so please make sense. Have a good evening. That's all, folks.